<laughs> it's a very time. good fit, actually. Yeah, that's on the other <laughs> that, side. That's, good. That, that's actually quite awesomely cool for this particular topic. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we are uh, we are recording. All right. All right, I'm going to introduce Stephen Cobb. Um, I've been wanting to get Stephen Cobb ever since we started CornCon in 2015. Um, with a name like Stephen Cobb, he's made for CornCon, aren't you, Stephen? Um, I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to let you uh, put your slides up. Uh, okay. Thank you so much for joining us from uh, you're I'm wondering. glad to finally be here at CornCon, even though I'm not in Iowa. Okay. Well, unless somebody through some other means of communication tells me this is not working, um, I'm going to assume it's working. Looks great. Okay, cool. Um, <clears throat> right. So, uh, good morning, uh, everyone, and welcome to the first talk of the second day of CornCon 2020. Um, it's actually afternoon where I am, which is not in Iowa, but in England. And uh, I'd really rather be in Iowa right now. The weather here is kind of wet and miserable. But this talk is about how hackers save humanity, something I would call a cautionary tale of existential risk. As I said, I am Stephen Cobb. This view here is the view of our Earth from the moon. But let's imagine for a moment that that's not the moon. It's a huge asteroid headed towards planet Earth. So that could end badly. Um, this is actually a, a screenshot from a movie, Greenland, which is going to come out later this year. Uh, and it's about a large heavenly body striking the Earth. And uh, it looks actually pretty good in the trailer. Uh, I just captured this from YouTube. But we know from prehistory, from our historic research, that this can happen, right? 66 million years ago, there was something called the Cretaceous Paleogene Extinction Event. And I believe every tetrapod above the weight of 50 pounds went extinct as a result of that. Which is not a happy thing to think about. And, and this isn't perhaps a happy talk. Maybe it's best it's in the morning so we can get over it for the rest of the day. But um, let me just tell you quickly about myself. My name is Stephen Cobb. I wrote a security book back in 1991, and I like corn. Um, this is Shea Cobb, my partner. She actually grows corn, even in England, and it grew pretty well this year. Uh, she also wrote Network Security for Dummies and knows just as much about security as I do, if not more. Uh, she also inspired my research into existential risk. Shay's long toyed with various uh, apocalyptic scenarios in which uh, people are sent back to a situation in, in, in our existence where we have to, for example, grow our own corn. And we actually grew our own corn this year because of something that happened, which was not I don't think an existential uh, event, but the COVID-19 pandemic, which reminded us all that there's always a risk for humans here on Earth that things can go wrong, sometimes very wrong, sometimes very quickly, sometimes fatally, sometimes at scale. And oddly enough, I was actually thinking about this problem at the end of last year and before the, the pandemic hit, and then we started to see these terrible numbers, and I, I really hate to show these numbers, but you know, they remind us that things can go very wrong very quickly. You know, the world has now passed one million uh, deaths from COVID-19, and this pandemic has, I think, exposed the world's lack of preparedness to deal with things on a global scale, particularly when those things are happening 
badly at scale. We've, we've also seen weaknesses in things like our technology. Several countries have tried uh, track and trace applications that haven't worked. Uh, countries have found that large or too many people uh, within their population can't work from home because they don't have decent internet or any internet at all. Um, and we found out a lot of things which hopefully uh, as the situation improves, hopefully next year we, we can improve. But if these things go much, much worse, if a risk becomes more than a catastrophe, it turns into what is potentially an existential risk. So there's risk and then there's existential risk. And this is just a loose definition of an existential risk, something that could end life as we know it for us and our survivors and not in a good way. I guess it stands to reason that if um, there was an event which took out all humans today, there would be no more humans. But this is a little bit more complicated than that, as hopefully I will be able to explain, and also able to explain why this relates to hackers and how hacking relates to this. So just to give some examples, risk would be, for example, you're trying to get a bootleg version of Green Land downloaded to watch it, uh, but it contains malware. There is a risk of that. There's a risk that a comet fragment might devastate Central Florida, as we can see from the WGVO traffic helicopter. Uh, that's a screenshot from the movie, uh, and that sort of happens in the movie. But existential risk would be the rest of the comet kills all humans. Another existential risk would be that a novel virus kills 90% of all humans. And this is one of the important distinctions about existential risks. They're not always totally 100% immediately fatal for everything in the future of humanity. It's possible that some people could survive. And in fact, there are studies of prior catastrophes, which show that it's actually quite likely uh, that some people would somewhere survive. After all, humans are spread all around the globe now, but it might not be enough people left to ever recover the way things were. And of course, for some of us who grew up in the 60s, uh, nuclear war ending all human life is kind of the mother of all existential risks, because that one could still take us out uh, in a big way. So risk would be, for example, the office coffee maker getting hit with ransomware and uh, a hat tip to Avast for um, having one of their researchers look into that and finding out you can actually run ransomware on a coffee maker. Um, and malicious code is a theme which um, I think is important in the context of existential risk. For example, the artificial intelligence unit of your self-driving car gets hit with jackware. Uh, jackware is a, a term I came up with a few years ago to describe the intersection of things like ransomware with um, self-driving vehicles. And that could be uh, a very bad risk. Existential risk though would be an artificial intelligence that was tasked with something like ending world hunger, deciding to kill humans which would end world hunger, but I think they made a movie about that. Again, it's things going very badly wrong, like an attempt to reverse global warming, and, and I think global warming has the potential to be an existential risk, but people have looked at the possibility of tinkering with the world's atmosphere intentionally to slow down the process of global warming so that we can have more time to clean up our act since we're kind of behind schedule in dealing with climate change and global warming. Uh, another existential risk is apocalyptic terrorists uh, creating and spreading a deadly bioengineered virus. And I'll be coming back to apocalyptic terrorists later, even though it's a bit of a tongue twister. And how about this? A rogue artificial general intelligence traps humans on Earth in a state of slavery. Now, I should mention and give a shout out to Dwyane Schwartow, uh, who will be talking more about artificial intelligence in the next presentation, not necessarily in this context, but artificial intelligence figures heavily in the existential risk literature, as I will explain. So what's existential risk got to do with hacking and cybersecurity? Uh, well, hackers and infosec people 
are typically very good at what could possibly go wrong. Right? We tend to look at each new development in technology. Uh, we, we, we could get excited about it. Uh, a lot of us like technology in a way, but we tend to think about what could go wrong. You know, recently, there was an update to iOS on, on the, uh, the iPhone, so you could use your iPhone to open your car, to unlock your car. And uh, Shay and I immediately saw that and went, what could possibly go wrong? You know, we have car thieves already uh, using electronic overrides and so on. What could possibly go wrong uh, with that? And so I think that existential risk, you could say, is the ultimate what could possibly go wrong. The hacker mentality is to poke and prod and explore and extrapolate with technology. It really helps to get into looking at what can possibly go wrong and then explaining it to other people. So uh, I'm not sure if this is a bumper sticker yet, but um, hackers don't break your things. We stop things breaking you. And uh, I'm going to talk about some really big things that we could maybe stop breaking us in our existential risk primer. I'm going to talk about definitions of existential risk topics of morality and statistics which come into play here. Um, one of the exciting things to me about being in security has been, since the early days, the diversity of direction from which people came to computer security. Right? So it, it, it wasn't like we all went to school and got a degree in this and then went to work in it. Uh, we came at it before degrees, some of us in the early days, from different directions, and yet that still happens. There are people who get into cybersecurity and hacking from different directions. And yeah, I have, a, I have degrees in, in English uh, and religion and uh, risk management. And religion actually comes into the existential risk uh, conversation very quickly. Morality becomes big. If you're into mathematics, statistics are big in existential risk. And so this is a topic which I think is rising up the public agenda and for which people from various directions within hacking and information security can get involved. Agents of the apocalypse are actually a thing in existential risk. Uh, we'll talk about the story of how hackers save humanity and then I'll provide some opportunities and resources for getting further involved in this or exploring this further. So, oh, it also includes the vulnerable world hypothesis. This is an interesting, not, not a tangent really, but an aspect of existential risk and technology. And we'll talk about that. So if you're still not convinced what's existential risk got to do with hacking and cybersecurity, I can't do a show of hands here, but I would, if I was there in person, say how many people saw this presentation at DEF CON 25, where John Sotos, who is the chief medical officer of Intel, not speaking as an Intel employee at this event, but talked about how genetic diseases uh, could act as a guide to digital hacks of the human genome. As with many con presentations, it's online, you can Google it and go through it. I'd, I'd sort of, you know, maybe have a friend with you because this, this presentation had slide after slide of horrible things you could do messing about with genes if you were malicious. And his call at that time was for the hacking community to start looking into this because the world is going to need help preventing this happen down the road. So let's look at the definition of existential risk from a more formal point of view. Bostrom, Nick Bostrom, is really the person who, who brought existential risk uh, to the public attention uh, in the early part uh, of the 2000s. And he used this definition, a risk that threatens the premature extinction of all human life or the permanent and drastic reduction of its potential for desirable future development. So this captures the idea that it's not just, oh, we all die and there aren't any more humans, but also, the possibility that most of us die and our future generations don't have a very good time. 
his original definition, I think, used the phrase, instead of all human life, all Earth originating intelligent life. And this is because the direction that Bostrom came from, getting into existential risk, was transhumanism. And transhumanism is the idea that technology can transform humans, uh, can extend our lives, can extend our capabilities, and uh, make the world a much, much better place, and maybe move us beyond the world, uh, into outer space, uh, into maybe computer networks, so that we can live on uh, virtually. Now, I'll give a lot of credit for Bostrom, to Bostrom, because as he looked at this and got very excited about the possibilities of transhumanism, he also realized things could go very, very wrong. And so he started to look at existential risk and really dove into that. You know, I actually do think things could go very, very wrong with transhumanism. And um, I tend to diverge from him on some of these, uh, some of these finer points, but he clearly established that, you know, an existential risk need not actually kill everyone. Um, if we were unable to rebuild society, and, and this is the position from a paper called the Global Priorities Project uh, that I'll talk about more, uh, then yeah, it would still qualify as an existential catastrophe. And yeah, something that ends life as we know it for us and our survivors and not in a good way. Obviously, there are different kinds of existential risks. So some, some of them can be categorized like this. So we have natural existential risks, the classic asteroid impact. Um, this is some, sometimes also a comet impact. I think they tend to use comets more in movies because they're easier for people to understand. Um, super volcanoes, that could happen, huge eruption. Uh, blocks the sun, plants can't process, so on and so forth. Natural diseases. I mean, we're seeing, you know, I tend to be in the COVID-19 is a naturally occurring disease camp that can have tremendous negative effects and has the potential to kill everybody. Anthropogenic is us, right? So human sourced risk. And, and these, this, is something which makes this a very modern topic. It wasn't really until 1950 that people realized, oh my gosh, you know, after we saw the end of World War II in nuclear explosions, we could destroy everything, that we could destroy the planet. There already was a rising sense before that, that humans were having a negative effect on the world. Uh, and in fact, uh, some philosophers who lived through World War I and World War II were developing thoughts along these lines. One of my favorite philosophers, Hans Jonas, was one of the first to come up with the idea that humans had a responsibility to not destroy the planet, to not, uh, as gentlemen said at the beginning of the day, F it up, right? That we have a responsibility not just to humans, but to the whole thing, because the first time ever, humans could destroy everything. And the nuclear holocaust is, is the big one, uh, the first that really focused attention on uh, existential risk and this possibility that we could end it all. But engineered pandemic, uh, close second there in that, you know, World War I, World War II, there was use of um, chemical weapons, some biological weapons, uh, and we haven't stopped, by the way, developing nuclear weapons, biological weapons, or chemical weapons. There are a few treaties around, but they're not working that well. Then we have genetics, and I referenced that earlier with Sotos's talk. Um, doesn't necessarily have to be this existential risk, something that somebody bad did. You could be well-intentioned and get it wrong. Could be accidental misuse of nanotechnology. And this is another example of how people come at existential risk from different directions. So when nanotechnology was making headlines, people started to think, oh my gosh, how could that possibly go wrong? Uh, Grey goo is something you may want to Google. The scariest talk that I can't talk about was one that involved a combination of genetic meddling uh, and nanotechnology, uh, intentional misuse of nanotechnology. Uh, 
thanks for that win. That was very frightening. Um, geoengineering could prove fatal. We could try to save the planet and fail badly. But also humans themselves could be the problem. Imagine a dictatorship armed with tremendous amounts of uh, technology uh, just taking over the whole world and making life miserable for all future humans. This is interesting. The pandemic arguably sits in the middle. Um, you may have seen a book reviewed called The Precipice by Toby Ord. So this is a big thick book which came out this year. Talk about great timing. Uh, as COVID was blowing up, so to speak, uh, this book about existential risks by a philosopher, Toby Ward, came out. And it, it's still a costly hardback at the moment, but you can find a lot of his writing, and in fact, Bostrom's stuff, and a lot of this material uh, is downloadable free online, the papers that they have written. He's got a great YouTube um, <clears throat> uh, lecture in which he describes why pandemic sits in the middle, because coronavirus shows us how the way we've shaped our world so far has in fact exacerbated the problem. You know, jet travel, global travel, that spread this thing faster than any previous thing has, has ever spread, arguably. And there are, of course, unknown unknowns, and we'll get to those in the vulnerable world hypothesis. Another way of categorizing things, and I won't go through all of these in detail, is that it's not just a big bang. Uh, Bostrom had these four categories, bangs, crunches, shrieks, and whimpers. So we may not necessarily realize as an existential risk unfolds that that is what it is. It may not just happen suddenly, uh, and it may not ever come to an end. For visual learners like myself, it maybe helps to graph things out. This was a simple early graph by um, Bostrom where you have a choice between endurable and terminal scope and three levels of intensity. So your car is stolen, that's a risk. If it's an endurable risk, a fatal car crash, obviously terminal, but it's only affecting one person in this case. You could have a recession in a country which was an endurable problem, not a nice problem to have, but an endurable problem, but there have been genocides which are right wiped out entire populations within a local context. You could have global issues like thinning of the ozone layer and existential risks sit in the top right hand corner because they are both global and in one way or another terminal. Some existential risks will start off as catastrophes. An existential catastrophe will then lead to, so if the catastrophe turns existential, that will mean it's either extinction or failed continuation. We can't carry on as we did, either through an unrecoverable collapse uh, or an unrecoverable dystopia. Uh, the authoritarian regime which rules the planet and makes us miserable. Uh, Ord created this uh, chart on the right. Another chart, which I won't go through in great detail, has more categories in the severity scale, damaging, catastrophic, and fatal. And this comes from the existential risk, diplomacy and governance uh, report, which was something which came out actually uh, uh, talks around the, the Paris Agreement on uh, climate change and global warming, when talk of geoengineering was big and uh, some of the things like aerosol spraying in the atmosphere uh, were put forward as a potential way to, to help and then people realize that could be very risky. And so that is addressed in this report. This report is also very good if you're kind of a policy wonk and you want to look at uh, an initial view of how we might address existential risk from a world uh, governance perspective. I said earlier there was math and morals. Um, is future life worth saving? Is uh, a moral question. How many people will there be in the future is kind of a scientific mathematical problem. Um, you know, if we save X billion people today, the, the current world population, we don't just save them, we save their future generations. Um, calculating future generation numbers is interesting because you want to do that if you're going to argue, I'd like some money to research 
uh, reduction of existential risk, how many lives could you save? And it turns out it could be hundreds or even thousands of billions if you saved people going extinct. Um, but what is the value of a reduction in ex existential risk relative to the value of future lives relative to present lives? So, you know, we have this thing uh, where we try to figure out how to spend our money globally, uh, what causes to support, and uh, how about asteroid deflection? You know, we, we know asteroids have caused serious problems in the past, they're still around. Um, in fact, the world is investing in asteroid defense. I'll talk about that more later, but it's costing billions and billions of dollars. Would it be better? And this argument happens around all kinds of space related things. Is it better to do it in do this stuff in space or here on Earth, make life better for the people who are alive at the moment and potentially their future generations, raising people out of poverty and, and so on? Should we should we do that first before we build the asteroid defense system? And of course, there's the other point of view, which we're all supposed to die anyway. This is the aspect of religion called eschatology, the end times, and uh, that can play into the existential risk discussion. The statistics are, are interesting. I'm not a statistician, but uh, Toby Ord in his book looks at this in, in great detail. And, and he came up with this, this is directly from his book, The Precipice, uh, calculating what's the chance of this happening in the next 100 years and, you know, Fortunately, the whole asteroid thing, that's one in a million. You get down to engineered pandemics, that's one in 30. Uh, unaligned artificial intelligence, sorry, one in 10. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I have serious doubts about some of these calculations and, and to give Ward his due, he, he, he puts in lots of caveats with these, but it's an interesting area to go if you're interested uh, in that sort of thing. Um, and you may want to use this in your arguments around existential risk. So we're all going to die anyway, brings us to agents of apocalypse. And Phil Torres is the go-to person on this. His book, The End, What Science and Religion Tell Us About the Apocalypse. Very good to read on this because he came at existential risk and, and he's written a lot about many aspects of the problem from a religious perspective. He, uh, he became an atheist and he began looking in critical detail at apocalyptic beliefs, the idea that some people are not just motivated to kill themselves for their religious beliefs, but to kill everybody. Um, you know, there are a lot of uh, debates around the morality of suicide bombing and, and, and the idea that that's using somebody to make your point because you're, if you organize somebody to commit to kill themselves in your cause, you're still around. So a true apocalyptic terrorist would be one who's both suicidal and omnicidal and wants to kill not them, just themselves, but everybody else. Idiosyc so, so, so Torres breaks this down into the agents, right? So these are different agents, not all religious, but idiosyncratic actors are people who are just out there in terms of their beliefs and attitudes. Eco-terrorists, many, many fine eco-terrorists, I'm sure, but there is a school of thought in eco-terrorism that we really should just kill ourselves because we're killing the planet. So it would be better to kill off all humans so that the planet could thrive. I have sort of issues with that, but um, that's out there. Rogue states, you would not necessarily think of them as an agent of killing everybody, but they might want to kill a lot of people and may not be able to stop themselves once they get started. Also though, super intelligence, that sort of advanced general intelligence on steroids, if that happened, if we got into a race condition where artificial intelligence just got smarter and smarter, it might get so smart it decided it didn't need us anymore. Um, I won't go into depth here about the, the discussion of risk versus resilience, but I wanted to put that there because it does ground us a little bit. In cybersecurity, we work very much in the area of risk assessment, risk management, risk analysis. And in recent years, the idea of resilience has been um, 
very strongly uh, advocated as this idea that we prepare and plan uh, for bad things so that we can recover them from them and, and cope better in the future and that acknowledging we don't know what's coming so you know we don't know what the next malware is going to be like what the next strain of ransomware is going to do uh, you know or is it going to be brought into work by an employee who's been bribed by a criminal you know we don't know what's going to happen next so if we develop resilience we can respond to anything there are some good debates about which perspective is best here risk or resilience at facing existential risk one of the issues is that probabilities um, are difficult to assess in this whole thing and um, do you remember the probability tests that or the probability examples you would have in statistics where you're supposed to build uh, pull a colored ball out of an urn of colored balls that's where we get to Bostrom's vulnerable world hypothesis and the black ball um, I was somewhat tempted to use black balls in the title of this talk but I thought that was kind of in bad taste and uh, could be a misconstrued of years ago about future inventions so if we think of an urn containing balls each of which represents a new piece of technology there are yellow balls red balls green balls green ball you reach in you can't see through the, it's a <laughs> it's an opaque urn so you reach in you pull out a ball it's a green ball that's technology that's really good no downsides great you pull out a red one that's clearly bad so you deal with it a black ball is one that is invariably or by default going to destroy the civilization that invents it right so it's really really bad stuff and he argues we haven't actually pulled a black ball out of the urn yet why will it destroy things though this is due to the semi-anarchic default condition. Again, a term that Bostrom's put out there that's very handy. It describes today, right? Limited capacity for preventive policing, limited capacity for global governance, diverse motivations throughout the world's population. So if you look at the pandemic, current pandemic, um, we've had difficulty controlling this. We would certainly have difficulty controlling for a situation where somebody finds and he uses this example the cheap nuke suppose somebody pulls a ball out of the urn a technology which enables nuclear detonation using a commonly available substance right if it was suddenly very easy and cheap to make nukes somebody might try to do that and we'd have a hard time policing that we have a limited capacity for global governance Look, look at what's happened with COVID. Um, America left who? Uh, China got blamed, um, other people got blamed, and the ability to control things really uh, has been shown to be weak. And everybody, or not everybody, but there are many different diverse motivations uh, out there. Want an autocracy, some people uh, want a dictatorship, some people want to rule the world. Uh, Others don't. Uh, some people have religious beliefs which conflict with non-religious beliefs and so on. So he calls this the semi-anarchic default condition into which a piece of deadly technology arrives in the form of a black ball and we're in tough shape. What do we do to prevent this? Global surveillance and policing. You might be able to get on top of this. But the challenge there is so great that you end up going, well, maybe we could use an advanced uh, sorry, an artificial in general intelligence for this. Uh, a super intelligence could be used to do this real-time global surveillance and policing of emerging technologies so that they don't go badly wrong. Which that brings us right back to the control problem for artificial intelligence and we're left trying to figure out what's next. I'll leave this here, uh, the authoritarian term, as this temptation to think that you know, really just a, the only way we move forward is a powerful centralized system of control. That's the only way of dealing with these big problems. Hopefully uh, that is not the case. So let's talk about how hackers, hackers save humanity. This is one of many stories that could easily be written. Uh, and I'm, I'm thinking we might have um, the X files as in X risk files. 
uh, could be a graphic novel, series of comics or short stories. Here's an example. So the world's governments, in order to slow global warming, have created the stratospheric aerosol injection system. So this has been tested in the labs to reduce solar radiation. It's called SACE. And it uses an AI to decide when, where, and how much aerosol should be released in order to create this gradual effect by which the, the world's uh, cooling takes place to give us more time to develop our solutions, get rid of uh, fossil fuels and so on. However, days before SAS goes live, a hacker finds a zero day vulnerability in the operating system that this AI is rumored to run on. Uh, as far as I can tell, most AIs are running on Linux now, but correct me if I'm wrong. But anyway, the hacker finds a zero day in the operating system. She reaches out to hackers in other countries to confirm, yes, this vulnerability does have the potential to enable a faulty CES aerosol release order. So this could lead to things going very, very badly wrong. This group of hackers then takes this to the SACE executives. They don't respond to the hackers' concerns. So the hackers go public with a dramatic proof of concept just in time to prevent a potentially catastrophic launch. So by poking and prodding, by not taking at their word people who make assurances about the safety and security of things, hackers save humanity. So I'm getting close to the end of time here. So <laughs> the end of my time, sorry, not the end of time. Uh, just some pointers here. Become a public in test technologist. Particularly, I think people who've been in cybersecurity for a while may want to think about this. And kudos to Bruce Schneier, who a few years ago put together this public interest technology resource page and started talking about this. The need for governments to get input in to this problem of um, technology that goes wrong and research it, educate people, engage people, and enlighten people so that the people who make policy decisions and decide where to spend money better understand how much things could possibly go wrong. Um, publicinteresttech.org. And uh, these resources, um, again, thanks, Bruce. You can Google and find this, Resources on Existential Risk. It's 170 pages of great content that uh, Bruce has pulled together. He pulled this together back in 2015 on this topic. Not included in there because they are more recent is Bostrom's Superintelligence, uh, Phil Torres on Morality, uh, and this recent book by Toby Ward. Uh, with that, one more thing. Do not fear, aid us here uh, to reassure people who are worried about the asteroid in the beginning, there is the International Asteroid Impact and Deflection Assessment Collaboration, ADA, which next year will launch this spacecraft, DART, to test a system of diverting asteroids. So uh, with that, I'd like to say thank you, CornCon 2020. I am uh, Stephen Cobb. You can reach out to me in lots of different ways. Um, and a huge thanks to uh, Shay Cobb for her wisdom, advice, and sanity checks on this presentation and everything else that I do. So now I'm in an interesting situation because I'm not quite sure what I do next, but I've got some chat. It says, thank you, Stephen. And um, let me check my watch here. Yes, yeah, 321. Um, I'm not sure if we're taking questions or where we take them. Um, I'd certainly take any questions you have about this offline. Yeah, um, we have I'm questions usually most that. active on Twitter, at the Cobb. Um, and uh, let me stop sharing now. Are so you I'm able back to, to uh, the screen where we've got some chat going on? Can you hear uh, me? Uh, hold on. Yes, can I hear you? Yeah, this is John. Um, yeah, so you see the Q&A window as well? Um, I've got the chat window. Oh, the opening up the Q&A window. There you go. <laughs> first question in the Q&A window is, how many beers did you spill on your first Aeroflot flight to Moscow? 
The correct answer is zero. Uh, I do know a gentleman on that flight who, who did spill some beer, but I won't name names. So yes, and Christopher here, great question. Um, how do you prevent genetic hacking without having a police state with no privacy? And I mean, that really gets to the heart of a lot of this, which is that existential risks are difficult in, in many ways. And, and I, you know, Sotos in his talk at uh, DEF CON a few years ago, uh, I think made that clear as well. How does a democratic open society share new technology and research, which we don't want to stop sharing because the benefits could be huge, the losses could be huge. So there's a, like, if we stopped research or controlled research and kept it to just a few people and kept it monitored, we might miss great opportunities because we all know that things come out of left field because so many people are poking around in technology. Um, I, I sadly don't have then the answer to that question. I do think we really have to get a move on lobbying uh, and pushing as citizens in every country to get our governments to work together. And this is where I'd bring it back to malware. Um, and I would say this, if, if we can't stop as a planet malware particularly ransomware. Well, let's just take ransomware. If we can't stop ransomware through intergovernmental, uh, international cooperation, then we're not really going to do much of a good job with existential risk. That uh, ADA program to deflect asteroids or test deflecting asteroids, uh, that was the United States and the European Union. That nearly broke apart. It's come back together. Um, so we can see there are problems of democratic countries uh, with an open society and respect for privacy policing themselves. Um, we need to, to work on that and we, we do need to push, I think, first and foremost for international cooperation, even though we might not like people. We did, it, perhaps a hopeful sign is the fact we did have you know, non-proliferation treaties uh, around nuclear weapons we did agree to stop the mass production of nuclear weapons by agreeing and making agreements with people that we were at war within a cold war. So we have to do more in that space. So that's sort of my non-answer. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Uh, hearing no more questions, I, I think I would, I would, you know, call my uh, my presentation over. I, I really appreciate this opportunity. Uh, very impressed with the technology here. Uh, hopefully, it will be used for good and not ill. I wish everybody a good day for the rest of the day. All right. Thanks, Stephen. It was great to have you here. Um, I'm I'm glad we were able to finally get you uh, as a speaker and an attendee. Uh, there are more discussions going on in uh, the Discord for the tracks one, two, and three. Track three is about to start up with uh, Phil Polstra uh, talking about forensics. Um, track two, we have George Simmons uh, starting up the new cyber engineer. And in this track, we will have Wynn Schwartow uh, in about five minutes. Thank you.